Senate Democrats have added language to the annual defense spending bill requiring women to sign up for draft eligibility. Democrats say a draft would only be implemented under a serious conflict when large numbers of Americans are needed for many roles beyond fighting on the front lines. Top Republicans have supported this in the past, but some are now opposed, accusing Democrats of pushing progressive politics on the military. Joining me now is The Hill's national political reporter, Julia Manchester. Julia, the military has not implemented a draft in more than 50 years. Why is this coming up now? Well, look, I think you have Democrats essentially arguing, look, uh, fighting on the front lines of a war looks very different than it has in the past. We're now starting to see, uh, you know, more cyber warfare, more tech warfare. And, you know, they're arguing that there is certainly a space for women in that, you know, line of fighting or, you know, part of the military that could be used on the front lines. However, it's getting quite a bit of pushback for Republicans who are seeking to put some vulnerable Senate Democrats, including Nevada, Senator Jackie Rosen and Montana Senator John Tester in a very tricky situation with Republicans already attacking those senators on this issue. Now, it's unclear whether uh, Majority Leader Chuck Schumer will bring this to the floor because of the potential political consequences of this, but Republicans very much pushing back on this, uh, talking about you know the gender identity politics and such. Yes, with those concerns in mind, is there really a chance that this could actually be implemented? It's unclear right now. I mean, look, I think enough Republicans are pushing back to where, you know, it might not be implemented. At the same time, though, we've heard Senate aides, you know, tell the Hill that, uh, look, there are some Republicans who are very much on board with this, some Republican voters, uh, that it's, you know, very much uh, promoting this idea of equality in the military. So it's possible, but the question is whether Chuck Schumer will want to take this uh, risk with a few of his very vulnerable senators being attacked over this. We are awaiting several big decisions from the U.S. Supreme Court. The most closely watched involves former President Trump's immunity claims. Trump says he can't be prosecuted in two federal cases regarding his handling of classified documents and attempts to overturn the 2020 election. When are we expecting a decision and what are the implications of this ruling? Well, since the court is in session, it could be imminent, meaning sometime this summer, but we don't have an exact date set on this. But in terms of the implications, look, this could have huge political implications going beyond 2024. Remember, former President Trump has argued in his other cases besides the New York City hush money cases, but in particular the federal cases he faces, that he has this thing called presidential immunity. That means that you can't be prosecuted uh, as a sitting president of the United States or presidents can't be prosecuted. So if he were to lose uh, this Supreme Court, he uh, this ruling, and at the same time win the 2024 presidential election, Election, there will be the question of whether he can be prosecuted beyond 2024, because we know that the other cases he faces, he's faced besides the criminal hush money case, they're not set to go to trial anytime soon or even this year. So it could happen down the line if he ends up losing this trial, but at the same time winning the election. Yeah, and beyond that, other decisions are looming on abortion rights, guns, and charges against January 6th rioters. Which decisions do you think are going to be most consequential? Well, I think abortion can certainly be, is always consequential. And it, we've seen that ever since 2022, it's have a, had a major impact on, um, you know, election turnout, particularly for progressives and Democrats. Um, guns, gun rights, also a very, um, you know, motivating issue, I would say, for both sides of the aisle. The January 6th issue is obviously um, very big considering the impact it had on the Capitol, on many lawmakers and, you know, how the, the, the I guess, the controversy surrounding the treatment of those prisoners and, you know, uh, how, how they're prosecuted, et cetera. But one other ruling I think is very important is this ruling that could come out on the rights of social media companies, for example, and censorship and that kind of a thing. We're going to hear more about that from the Supreme Court. And that could give us a clearer idea of where social media companies, you know, relatively new companies, you know, obviously social media is a pretty relatively new concept, you know, how they apply into the law or how the Supreme Court views these companies. And Julia, new national polling in the U.S. presidential race shows Joe Biden making some gains. The Fox News poll has Biden at 50 percent and Trump at 48. It's the first time Biden has led in this poll since October. 
What accounts for this shift? Look, I think there could be a number of different factors here. Some of it could be, um, you know, as a result of spending on the Biden campaign's part. And it also could be in terms of getting those advertisements and messaging out. And we know that they've been fundraising quite a bit. But it also could be a result of former President Trump's hush money trial in New York and how some voters may be turned off to the idea of, you know, a presidential candidate, a sitting president being a convicted felon. Uh, so I think there's a number of uh, factors playing into this, but we're going to see the polls go up and down. I guarantee you, um, you know, there's a chance that in this the same poll and other polls, Trump will be leading Biden. So it's, you know, we're going to see this go back and forth, and it's just kind of hard to make a prediction this far out. Yeah, and speaking of political spending, the National Republican Congressional Committee outraised the Democrats' congressional fundraising arm for the month of May, and 32% were first-time donors. Is that big uh, jump from Republicans angered about Trump's conviction in New York? I think it is. It's, it's, it could be playing a part of that, but it also could be a part of the NRCC's ground game in some of these very important uh, congressional districts. I think you're going to start to see, um, you know, these dis th these races really come to light, the very vulnerable races in the House. Um, you know, I think this is also very important because we know that House Democrats for some time now have been viewed as the favorites to win um, in the mid midterms. However, if Republicans are raising this much money and they're getting their message out effectively, that could certainly put Democrats more on defense in some of these very vulnerable districts. So, um, you know, good news for Republicans so far. But like I said, with the presidential race, we have a long way to go until Election Day. And we are just one week from the first debate of the presidential race. Joe Biden and Donald Trump will face off next Thursday in Atlanta. It will be just Biden and Trump on the stage. RFK Jr. did not make the cut. What are the candidates doing to prepare? Well, we know that President Biden will spend a week in Camp David prepping for this. And we've heard the Trump campaign launch a number of attacks on Biden, accusing um, you know, him of t taking drugs um, to somehow hype himself up. There's obviously no evidence in those claims. This is just a rhetoric at this point. But um, look, it's going to be very consequential for both of these two candidates. Um, we know that with the first presidential debate back in 2020, they were shouting over each other. It was hard for anyone to get a word in, sometimes very hard to listen to. And a lot of Republicans I've chatted with have said that in retrospect, former President Trump could have lost the election on that night because he came in so hot into that debate. So, you know, I think this obviously plays a big role in, in the election. It is earlier than debates normally are. So this could have an impact on early voting, but it's the first time we've really seen a presidential debate held between either of the two parties' conventions. Yeah, and we're hearing that comments by former President Trump about nuclear warfare set off alarm bells with the former governor of Puerto Rico who was present for the remarks. This happened back in 2017. Trump then told the governor of Puerto Rico at the time, Ricardo Rossello, that if nuclear war happens, we won't be second in line pressing the button. Explain the context here and why was this being discussed and also what is Trump saying in response to those claims? Yeah, so this was, um, you know, done at, you know, in Puerto Rico during, uh, you know, in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. This was in Ricardo Rosseo's um, new memoir that's supposed to come out. This was a conversation between the two of them. Um, you know, I haven't yet seen Trump's response, but I think, um, you know, this is going to be painted by, you know, some of his his allies as something that, you know, could be seen as a political t attack on him, but also, um, you know, could be used to paint him as a strong man, you know, talking about the U.S.'s capabilities here. We know at the time, um, you know, sort of in the late 2010s, like 2017, 2018, there w was um, a lot of chatter about North Korea's own nuclear uh, missile program, and we saw them testing a lot of missiles. Former President Trump even met with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. So this was clearly something that was on the president's mind at the time. Um, and he was doing a lot of things unconventionally during the period, like meeting with the leader and really extending that olive branch, even though um, we've seen talks between the two nations since cease. So-called cheap fakes involving President Biden are flooding the internet. They are often edited or cropped to make the president appear confused. 
You know, we did see something similar with Hillary Clinton leading up to the 2016 election. Is the Biden campaign taking this seriously? And what are they doing to push back? Yeah, the Biden campaign and the White House are taking this very seriously. They're accusing conservative-leaning news outlets of essentially clipping these images and to make it seem like the president isn't fully with it. Um, they're saying these images lack context um, and, you know, they're easy to get a hold of these images on social media, on television, et cetera, on the Internet. So I think that they've acknowledged that they're very concerned about this and they've hit back at some of these conservative news outlets that they say are employing these cheap fakes. And just a few hundred votes separate two Republican congressional candidates in Virginia in a race that's testing the power of incumbency, endorsements, and money in politics. The race in Virginia's 5th congressional district between Bob Good and John McGuire is likely headed for a recount. Why is this race being followed so closely? <laughs> You know, for a number of reasons. First of all, this race is being seen as a revenge tour for former President Trump and former Speaker Kevin McCarthy. We know that on Trump's uh, side of this, uh, um, Bob Good endorsed Ron DeSantis over Donald Trump as Donald Trump was facing a series of legal indictments. And then for Kevin McCarthy, we know that Bob Good played a role in his ouster as Speaker. So we're seeing national politics impacting this very rural congressional district in West Virginia, or excuse me, in Virginia's 5th Congressional congressional district. Now, going into election night, I think a lot of us were predicting that Bob Good would lose. We saw internal polling from John McGuire, uh, his opponent, uh, showing uh, Bob Good down 10 points. However, we've seen that it has been much, much closer. A lot of Trump allies have told me this is impressive. This shows how, um, you know, this shows how forceful the former president's endorsement is with his, um, you know, with these congressional candidates like John McGuire. But at the same time, though, I'm not sure that a lot of people watching this expected Bob Good to perform so well. So we'll keep an eye out on this race. It's certainly a nail biter. Yeah, and never underestimate the power of the incumbent. Uh, Julia Manchester, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Former President Trump continues his lead in almost every swing state, according to new Emerson College polling. New data released today shows Trump has a slight edge over President Biden in six of seven battleground states. These new numbers show voters have yet to be swayed by the former president's felony convictions in New York. Joining me now is senior director for Emerson College polling, Matt Taglia. Matt, there has been little movement in these polling numbers since Trump's conviction in Arizona. The former president has a five-point lead over Biden, but looking at independent voters' support for Trump, it has dropped 5%. Are we seeing a significant shift in independent voters? That's right. So we have seen some shifts, as you mentioned, in Arizona. Trump's support has dropped about five points among these voters, and it's dropped about 3% in Michigan, 8% in Pennsylvania, but Trump still wins independent voters overall. And we can see that Biden has actually lost uh, among uh, about 6% among independents in Georgia. And it's the same story in Nevada, uh, where he lost about 5%. So all of that said, the margins among independents are narrow across the board. Most are split between the two candidates. And in some states like Pennsylvania, Biden actually wins independence after we push undecided voters to choose between one of the two. So I think overall we're seeing some fluctuations, but it's still very close among these voters and it's variable by state with a lot of factors in play. Let's talk about Georgia. Trump still holds a small lead over President Biden, but polling shows 14% are undecided. Could we see voters waiting to maybe make a decision after next week's debate? You know, we just might, especially with the debate being held in Atlanta. Uh, but both Georgia and elsewhere, undecided voters we see are large, largely younger. Um, they are slightly less educated than the rest of the electorate. And among almost all of them, the top concern for them is the economy. Sometimes a majority, sometimes a party plurality. Uh, so these might be some issues that both candidates can speak to during the debate. Um, a plurality also say that they're less likely to support Trump as a result of the convictions in New York. So that's another thing that the campaigns might address during the debate. Uh, it's something that either might be able to address or capitalize on if you're the Biden campaign. But I think more broadly, these voters aren't very tuned in. 
They'll need uh, a little bit of prompting in order to even watch the debates. But assuming that they do, this could be a major factor in shoring up some of that support. In Nevada, Biden is trailing by three points, but that's relatively close compared to what we've seen from other recent polling. Is this a sign that Biden is actually gaining ground in Nevada? Well, you know, Biden is doing better than he was in our February and March polling. Not quite as good as his high water mark in April, though, where he was down by just two points. Uh, but it's another state with a really high undecided factor like Georgia. It's at 12 percent. And undecideds are breaking for Biden, uh, making it a split race once we push them to make a decision 50-50 between Trump and Biden. But where Biden runs into some real trouble is with the expanded ballot. So he splits uh, his uh, he splits those undecided voters with Trump. However, Kennedy gets 22 percent of this vote. That's sizable. And it's not necessarily a net negative for Biden, but it's leaving votes on the table that he otherwise might be able to capitalize on. Um, overall, Nevada is a hard state for campaigns. It's highly transient. It's hard to get a read on the electorate, frankly. So both campaigns are going to likely struggle here. But I think the Biden campaign has more to lose, being at a bit of a, bit of a de deficit and having a little bit more work to do. And what else are you seeing in these swing states? Has there been any other significant shift? Frankly, not much. Uh, all of the results are within the margin of error. There have not been major shifts since uh, our previous polling last month. Um, but I think Minnesota is interesting. This is the first time that we've included them in our swing state polling. Um, and we did poll the state in October among adults. It, overall, it was close uh, with Biden up by about two points, but that had a high undecided factor that had a high someone else factor before the candidates were necessarily kn known to voters. Um, and we see in this polling that Trump is actually winning independence uh, with 42 percent versus 36 percent for Biden before the push. Um, and among most likely voters, Biden is winning 48 to 45 percent, which increases to 52 to 48 percent for Trump after we push those undecided voters. So it, I think that's interesting. Uh, Minnesota is certainly in play here. And uh, I think it is going to force the Biden campaign to spend some money to play some defense in a state that they likely thought was a safe bet. Yeah, Minnesota will definitely be an interesting state to watch. Thank you, Matt Taglia. North Korea and Russia are strengthening ties with a new strategic partnership between the two countries. Leaders Kim Jong-un and Vladimir Putin signed a deal Wednesday to offer mutual aid and protection against their enemies, specifically in times of war. According to North Korean state media, it would obligate each nation to provide immediate military assistance should one of the two be invaded. It's still not clear what kind of military assistance would be provided under the deal. The agreement comes as the U.S. has backed Ukraine in its war against Russia and has worked closely with South Korea on its capabilities to fend off a North Korean attack. It's a hot one out there and temperatures are continuing to rise as heat waves are sweeping across the U.S. Now federal agencies are updating their climate impact plans. Two dozen government agencies, both military and civilian, are rolling out these adaptations for 2024 to 2027. The plans seek to expand the focus on climate risks in government facilities and supply chains. The proposed changes include adding local flood risk information to building planning processes. Travis Scott has been arrested in Miami for trespassing and disorderly intoxication. The rapper was taken into custody by police at the Miami Beach Marina after reportedly arguing with the occupants of a yacht. According to TMZ, police say they began to escort Scott away from the boat, but claim he began yelling obscenities to the people on board. Scott was allowed to leave the scene, but returned five minutes later. Cops say they made contact with the rapper who became erratic and belligerent, resulting in his arrest. Scott posted a $650 bond and was released, according to jail records. And that's today's Daily Debrief. I'm Drew Petromo. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe to The Hill's YouTube channel. And come back here soon for the intersection between politics and policy.